Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to another episode of our series, The Sciences of the Quran. I'm your host, Yasser Qadi. In today's episode, we're going to talk about a number of miscellaneous issues. And the first of these issues is the verses of the Quran and the surahs of the Quran. How did these verses and surahs get decided? Where did the names of the surahs come from? And what is the quantity of verses and surahs in the Quran? Realize that the verses of the Quran and the surahs of the Quran, both of them are mentioned by name in the Quran itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when we reveal an ayah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when ayat come down, and an ayah is one verse. In another uh, verse, Allah says, when we reveal a surah, then the hypocrites say this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself references that the Quran has been divided into ayat and surah. He himself says so. This is not something from us, from the scholars. Allah himself clearly says that the Quran is, is composed of verses and that these verses come together to form surahs. Now, even though the ayat and surah are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain aspects the Prophet sallallahu also informed us about. And of them is where does an ayah begin and end? The Prophet sallallahu did not sit down and say, this surah has this many ayat. This is very rare. Only once in a while. For example, Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah says, this is a verse that is seven. This is a surah that is seven verses. Sab al-Mathani. And uh, for example, in another uh, surah, the Prophet ﷺ said, there is a surah in the Qur'an composed of 30 verses. And he meant Surah Al-Mulk. So sometimes he told us, but most of the time he didn't. Therefore, how did the later scholars decide where to put the endings of the verse uh, numbers? The response, wherever the Prophet ﷺ stopped regularly, this is what they took to be the ending of a verse. But you see, sometimes he would stop at different places. Sometimes he would run out of breath at one place and other times he wouldn't run out of breath there. So he would stop occasionally on some verses and occasionally not. And this difference of opinion exists to this day in the Ummah. We find certain recitations of the Qur'an, they have slightly different numberings of verses than other recitations. And we'll talk about recitations in a uh, future episode. But for now, I want you to re realize and remember that the number of verses in the Qur'an depends upon the recitation, called in Arabic the qira'ah that you are reciting. Now the most common qira'ah that people who are living in English-speaking lands in Western countries, most of the world that follows, it is called the qira'ah of Hafs and Asim. And this qira'ah, qira'ah of Hafs and Asim, it has 6,236 verses in the Qur'an. So 6,236 verses according to the qira'ah that we recite. And the other uh, recitations, and we are, there are 10 total recitations, they have slightly different numbers, between 6,210 uh, all the way up to uh, 6,236. So a difference of 20 or 30 verses, that's it. Now when we say difference of verses, it doesn't mean some qira'at have missing verses. No, not at all. The Qur'an is exactly the same word for word, sentence for sentence. The entire Qur'an is the same between the different recitations. But what is different, one uh, recitation might have split a long verse into two. Another recitation might have taken those two verses made them into one. So what is different is where the verse begins and ends, but not the actual words within the uh, verses. Also realize that the arrangement of the verses is unanimously agreed upon within a surah. The arrangement of the verses, in other words, when you're reciting the, the Qur'an, you're reciting the verses, it is exactly the same in all of the recitations by unanimous consensus of all the scholars of Islam. There is no opinion of a scholar that this verse should go in Surah Baqarah instead of Ali Imran, or this verse should be in Surah Al-Fil instead of Surah Al-Nas, no such thing. All the scholars of Islam unanimously agree about the arrangement of the verses within a surah. 
This is with regards to the, uh, the verses or the ayat. Now how about the surah? And by the way, what does an ayah mean? An ayah means a miracle. An ayah means a sign. An ayah means a point of reflection. So by calling the verses of the Quran ayah or ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing that these verses are miracles and they are signs for us to ponder over. Allah also calls a collection of ayat surah or surahs, surah. And a surah means a walled gate, a raised gate. So it is as if a surah has taken a number of ayat and has protected it. So it has demarcated a number of ayat. And this is what a surah does. It is a, a walled gate, if you like. We're talking about linguistic meaning. It is a raised platform which has taken a number of ayat and has placed them in one particular place. And the surahs of the Qur'an are 114 in number. 114 surahs of the Qur'an. But the arrangement of the surahs is subject to some difference of opinion. The arrangement of the surahs is subject to difference of opinion. What is the difference of opinion? Well, the question arises, who was the one who decided how to arrange the surahs? Remember we said that the verses themselves are unanimously agreed upon. That the arrangement is from Allah, the Prophet ﷺ recited it always the same. The arrangement of the surahs on the other hand is a subject to the difference of opinion. What is this difference of opinion? Well, there are three opinions. One opinion says that this arrangement is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And that it was revealed in this way and that the Prophet ﷺ recited it in this way and therefore, this is the uh, way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it. Another position is the uh, other side, and they say that this opinion is the opinion of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They decided to arrange the surahs in some order. They had to do it in some order. They knew all the surahs, and these are 114 in number. Now they have to place them in some order. And the Prophet ﷺ did not tell them, according to this opinion, which order to place it in. And so they decided to place it in this particular order because it was what made sense to them. And because the companions unanimously agreed to do so, then we should respect the decision of the companions and also remain firm to the same ordering of the Qur'an. We should not switch around. This is the second position. And the third position is kind of sort of in the middle and it says that all of the surahs the companions heard from the Prophet ﷺ, they're pairing together except for a few of them which they themselves thought how to do so. And between these three opinions, it appears that the last one or the third one has the most historic evidence for it that many of the surahs, for example, uh, Baqarah and Ali Imran, the Prophet ﷺ paired them together in a hadith. Whoever recites Baqarah and Ali Imran, he said so. Also, Surah Falak, Surah Nas, he paired them together. So many times the arrangement was indicated by the Prophet ﷺ, but for a very few exceptions, the companions had no guidance where to place them. And especially the last surahs revealed. For example, Surah Al-Baqarah. It is narrated that Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked Uthman ibn Affan, he said, O oh, oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, why did you place Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, excuse me, why did you place Surah Al-Tawbah next to Surah Al-Anfal? Even though Anfal was revealed so early and, and Surah Al-Tawbah was revealed so late. And so, Uthman ibn Affan replied, My dear nephew, Surah At-Tawbah was revealed towards the very end of the life of the Prophet wasallam, and we didn't know where to place it. And when we read it, it sounded very similar to Surah Anfal. So we placed it along with Surah Al-Anfal. The content was similar, so we placed the two surahs together. This incident, this narration is very important because it tells us that for the other surahs, the companions knew where to place them. It is only a few surahs that they were not sure where to place them. So they decided, for example, to put Anfal and Tawbah together, even though the Prophet ﷺ had not told them to do so. Why did they do so? Well, for two reasons. Firstly, you have to put it in some order. And secondly, the opinion of the companions is definitely the best opinion. And that is why after their times, all the scholars of Islam unanimously agreed that we should stick to their opinion and respect uh, their position and we are not allowed to print a Qur'an except in the order of the companions because they unanimously agreed to do so. However, printing is one thing, reciting is something else. 
we may recite the surahs in another order if we want to do so. If, for example, in the prayer we stand up to pray, we may recite a verse, for example, in uh, Surah Al-Anfal, and then we stand up for the second rak'ah, and then we may recite a verse from Surah Al-Baqarah or Surah Tawbah. There is nothing wrong if we go back or forward. Even though it is preferred to keep the order of the Qur'an because the companions did so, in our recitation even. But there is no sin, there is no harm if we recite a portion of the Qur'an and then in the next rak'ah we recite another portion that is before it. But we should not obviously uh, pick and choose based upon women desire, rather if there is a need to do so or if the uh, verses are compatible somehow, then it is permissible to do so. There is no sin in that. It is narrated, for example, once that the Prophet وسلم, recited uh, Surah Al-Ali Imran and Surah Al-Nisa, but he switched the order around. So he recited Surah Al-Nisa before Surah Al-Ali Imran, even though the order that we have it is in fact Surah Al-Ali Imran and Surah Al-Nisa, but he did so, and this shows that it is permissible to recite the surahs in a different order, but the actual verses within the surah must retain the same order. Uh, the, the last issue that I want to discuss in today's episode is the issue of the, the letters that occur at the beginning of the surahs. Alif, Lam, Mim, Hamim, uh, Noon, Qaf, Yasin. What is the meaning of these letters? These letters in Arabic, they are called the Muqatta'at, Al Huruf Al Muqatta'at, which means the disjointed individual letters. And there are so many opinions about them. We don't have time to get into opinions. I just want to say that the strongest opinion appears to be that the purpose of these letters is to prove the miraculous nature of the Qur'an by demonstrating that the Qur'an is composed of the very letters that we speak. The Qur'an is composed of the very letters that we use. And yet, the speech is the speech of Allah and it cannot be imitated. By emphasizing that the Qur'an appears to be in the speech of men by using alif, lam, mim, ha, mim, noon, and yet it is not the speech of men. This is a way to demonstrate the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, and this is the position of many of the uh, famous scholars of Islam, and of course there are many other positions as well. In the end of the day, only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows for sure which one is correct. So to summarize today's episode, we talked about the verses and the surahs, and we said the arrangement of the verses is from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The arrangement of the surahs, most of them is from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. However, the names of most of the surahs are from the companions. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi only named some of the surahs. And we said that the beginnings of the, uh, the letters of the Qur'an, alif, lam, mim, ham, mim, it is meant to indicate the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. This brings us to the conclusion of today's episode. Inshallah ta'ala will continue talking about some of the more fascinating sciences of the Qur'an in our future episodes. I hope to see you then. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الله نزل أحسن الحديث كتابا متشابها كتابا متشابها مثانية قشعر منه جلود الذين يخشون ربهم ثم تَلِينُ جُلُودُهُمْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ